Okay, so we're now live. I'm just gonna give it a minute for just any attendees to join before I introduce everyone. Can we see who's attending? I don't think so. I think only I'm able to see that. Okay. Can you tell us how many people approximately? So right now we already have two people. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking now. Um, hello everyone and welcome to the recent urban planning studies and their impact on Staten Island and the surrounding communities. Uh, my name is Anissa Bakteshi. I work with the SIEDC and I just want to introduce our panelists here today. We have Adam Zellner, Greener by Design. We have Kai, Kay, I'm sorry, Hayashi at VJH Advisors. We have Eugene Flatterin from Cetro Ready Architecture. We have Peter Van Den Koy at CME. We have Rachel Bramwall from Hatch. Thank you so much everyone for joining us and for being here today. Adam, you can take it away. <laughs> Great, thank you, uh, Anissa. Appreciate that introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, my name is Adam Zellner. I'm the president of a company called Greener by Design and we do environmental asset management, which means we do master planning in the environment and energy space uh, across the country. And uh, the panel we're here to talk about today uh, is about the various plans, right? Master plans, stormwater plans, all kinds of plans that you're gonna hear uh, that this group of, of extremely good panelists are going to talk about. Um, and my job here in opening up is to tell you two things. One, um, stay tuned for, for an exciting, um, you know, outline of what's happening on the island. But number two, uh, you know, in a past life, I, I was the policy director for the governor of New Jersey. And I led at one point the state's master planning office and trains, transit village office, as we called it, um, a lot of redevelopment stuff. And people then did, never had belief that Jersey City and Hoboken and other places would come flying back. There were many places that were abandoned for years, uh, underutilized. Some places were utilized, but not in great ways. And over time, these plans um, became reality. And you can see these things building out. And the same thing is happening in Staten Island. And I understand we might have a lot of some, some younger folks here that are watching. And what, what I'm gonna emphasize as I, I introduce our panelists to kind of introduce themselves briefly, but talk about their roles is sometimes people don't pay attention to this idea of planning because they think it's a nebulous sort of, hey, we'll just think about things. But the reality is these plans um, find their way into the fabric of Staten Island and become reality. And whether that's the beginning of, of the green zone planning, and, and I wanna thank my friend Steve Grillo as I was talking before about who able to give me a nice outline of some of the plans that, that have been done out here. Um, the BOA planning, the bids that have kicked off the West Shore, the uh, Bay Street development, the Skyway, the gondola, there's all these projects you're gonna hear, but they're rooted in the beginning of planning. And what I'm gonna encourage everybody over and over um, as, as I turn this over to our panelists is I want you to think about how you should, should be getting involved in this planning. Do you know what plans are even at your own neighborhood, your house? like? Well, have you ever gone online just to see what's been done around you and whether or not you've participated? Because I'm gonna encourage everybody at the end of this to do a little homework about where they live, work, go to school, um, and understanding what neighborhoods and what plans have been adopted because um, these plans become reality very quickly. And so with that, we thought today we'd present from, as I described as an, an economist, from macro down to micro, right? Big picture down into your neighborhood. Um, and we're going to start um, with, with my dear friend Rachel, who works with Hatch and, um, you know, has a big picture um, understanding of some of the things that go into these plans and what has to happen to make um, what you guys see as reality on the ground happening. And so with that, we're going to kick it off. And Rachel, if you don't mind uh, um, taking the lead on this, um, and then we'll open it up to some questions and we'll have an open dialogue at the end of this to keep it fun and exciting. Great. Um, should I just do, do a quick introduction and then go into the presentation? Great. Um, so I'm Rachel Bramwell. Um, I'm a senior urban planner at Hatch. Um, my background is in urban planning and economics. Um, and about two years ago, we were contracted by SIEDC to produce a local needs assessment for the borough of Staten Island. Um, I will go into just a couple of slides on kind of what we did. 
Um, and okay. okay, can everyone see that? You great. Okay. Um, so Hatch worked with SIEDC to put together a local needs assessment. Um, we had a couple of sub consultants as well who worked with us on this project. Um, Urbane Development, who did community outreach um, and advice on affordable housing, um, and also Insight Civil Engineering, who looked at utilities, infrastructure, and transportation. Um, so what is a local needs assessment? Um, this was really done by SIEDC to understand kind of the current state of the borough um, in light of a lot of development that has been occurring in Staten Island over the last five or so years, um, in addition to a lot of development um, and projects that were planned for the borough. Um, obviously, some of these things have changed with COVID. Um, so just as a time frame, we did this work um, from 2018 to 2019. Um, and SIEDC really wanted to understand kind of what the demographics of um, Staten Island looked like, what some of the transportation constraints and opportunities were, um, where some of the housing pain points were, um, to try to understand um, first what the need was in order to do some more detailed project specific planning, uh, which Eugene, Kay, and Peter will, will talk about in a little bit. Um, so as Adam mentioned, we did a kind of high level overview of um, the borough of Staten Island and where kind of where a lot of these different things, um, kind of state of these different things. So we looked at demographics, um, land use and real estate trends. Um, we looked at some strategic locations um, that we could be recommending for uh, various future projects and kind of topics of projects. Um, and we looked at transportation and infrastructure. And then this work ultimately culminated in some high level recommendations um, around some key themes, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of all of this work, um, but just as an example, we looked at um, transportation trends um, and kind of where, where the pain points were. Um, using publicly available data. Um, so this work was done by um, Insight Civil Engineering, just trying to understand um, from a transportation perspective, you know, this is, this is showing congestion pain points, uh, but to really try to get some data behind a lot of the trends that people knew were occurring in Staten Island or kind of anecdotally um, were aware of, but really trying to document those and understand specifically um, again, where some of the constraints and opportunities were. So this is just one example of some of the analysis we did. Um, we also did extensive demographic analysis looking at um, um, you know, age trends, um, jobs where people are living and working, um, more extensive commute analysis um, amongst various other things. Um, so ultimately, we kind of came up with some high level opportunities and constraints that, um, that Staten Island was facing um, to try to understand how these could um, then be translated or to kind of give SIEDC some areas to focus on. Um, so some of the opportunities, you know, we looked at TOD and where that, or transit oriented development and where that could be occurring. Um, we looked at business improvement districts and where, where those might make sense in the future. Um, we looked at a lot of bike infrastructure. Um, bike sharing programs were really new to Staten Island at the time. Um, so just kind of expanding on those. Um, and then in terms of constraints, um, utility and sewer infrastructure is was a you know, major issue that, that we saw. Um, of course, housing, we didn't do a detailed analysis of, kind of housing opportunities, um, but we did get a sense, um, you know, some of the areas that were more, more rent burdened as opposed to others. Um, and then we also looked at resiliency and climate change um, and you know, some areas where, where that could 
be more, more of a focus. And then ultimately, we came up with these overarching themes for how SIEDC um, might want to consider approaching um, development and future projects. Um, so these are not pictures of Staten Island, um, but more precedents and examples that SIEDC could look to for inspiration um, for, you know, for future planning. Um, so this really set the stage for some of the future work that SIEDC would commission. Um, okay, we'll talk about the said study um, and really just kind of trying to prioritize some of some of these areas for for future work. That's that's it. Um, so should we? Do we want to do questions now or do we want to do all the presentations? You no, know, I think uh, we'll open it up uh, and uh, I think you'll have to click stop sharing on yours. Um, but, you know, I'll, um, if I'll take a point of privilege, right? The, um, can, so can I ask Rachel in general in these, as you guys are looking at that, what, what kind of public participation, what kind of folks participate, especially since, again, we have some young folks here um, in, in you know, younger folks that are frankly looking at a picture of what their communities may look like in five to 10 years? Yeah, so we, did, um, we didn't do wide outreach community engagement as part of this process, um, but we did talk to a lot of different, um, about 50 different stakeholders across, across the borough, um, including educational institutions, um, major employers, um, small business owners, um, really just trying to get a cross section of, um, of people across the, the island and really understand what, what their, um, what some of the issues were that they faced um, and what some of the challenges were. Um, and then, you know, tried to come up with some um, higher level recommendations on how, how those things could be, could be addressed. Great. Do any of our other panelists have any questions? I have a question from a from an attendee. If you'd like to take that now, sure, that'd be great. Awesome. So this is from Ray. He asks, from all of your studies, do you think protected bike lanes are feasible on Sun Island? Would it be accepted by the residents? Yeah. So I think that protected bike lanes are feasible and definitely something that. Um, you know, SIDC and Stat Island should be um, should be considering. Um, I'm not sure. I guess in what respect um, accepted by residents you were kind of thinking about. Um, but I, I mean, we we definitely thought it was something that should be should be focused on. Um, you know, as as part of a broader infrastructure strategy across across island i'm sure some of the other panelists will touch on some of the transportation issues a little bit a little bit more awesome awesome uh, i don't have any other questions besides that great thank you rachel um and you know this is the beginning as you guys will see and forgive this because if we were in person you'd see me talking more with my hands as we begin to come in right these big issues you're going to see for Seinfeld fans. These are George Costanza's worlds that are colliding together between all the different plans. And, and speaking of which, good transition, um, you know, we're, um, Peter is going to talk about some of the planning work that he has done. I, I've, much like Rachel, I've had the pleasure of working with Peter um, uh, before on a bunch of things. And I, Peter, I must tell you, the stormwater aspect caught my attention the other day as we were in one of those wonderful rainstorms. And you're going to hear a little bit about stormwater planning and some things that for a lot of folks who say stormwater planning, why does that? Well, if you've ever sat in traffic because of that favorite puddle or that favorite area, if you've ever tried to put a bike lane in where those where it goes underwater and people have to curve around that into the street, you'll begin to understand this nexus between thinking about development and impervious cover and stormwater and a few other things. And, um, <clears throat> and so as we narrow in on that, I hope that's going to provoke a lot more questions at the local uh, level. And so with that, let, let me introduce my friend Peter. And Peter, why don't you take it away and talk a little bit about some of that planning. Thanks, Adam. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Van Inquay, uh, Director of Planning with CME Associates. And uh, we've been involved in several feasibility studies on Staten Island over the past few years. The uh, studies I'm going to focus on today include the 
the stormwater feasibility study in the West Shore Business Improvement District that Adam had mentioned, and also the um, Skyway feasibility study in the Port Richmond community. And um, with that, I, I brought a few slides with some graphics uh, that I'd like to, uh, to share at this time. And so this is just um, a, cover slide, a cover slide rather from the uh, feasibility study for the Skyway that we have prepared. Um, this project is essentially um, a, uh, a elevated rail um, project. Let me see if I can get this slide to actually, there we go, sorry about that. So um, it's an elevated rail project that um, is focused on taking an existing uh, railway that literally runs right through the center of town. It's probably about 20 feet above the grade um, on, on pillars through most of it. And it uh, goes from the foot of the Bayonne Bridge all the way over to a water pollution control plant just to the east of, uh, of Port Richmond. And, um, you know, essentially what SIEDC had done before our involvement was have a, um, a design competition where they received probably more than 20 different proposals, went through them, they had uh, voting by uh, members and members of the public and uh, an award-winning design was, was chosen. And so our charge is to come in and um, not only look at the feasibility study from a, or the feasibility of the project from a constructability and finance standpoint, but also look at the design to see how we can build off of that vision that was um, the award-winning design. So I just wanna show you a couple uh, quick slides to, to give you the, the context for the project and then um, go into a little bit more detail about it. So the next slide is, um, just some existing conditions. It's a, a structure about a half mile in, in length is the, the segment that, that we're focused on. So it's huge, but uh, these are just representative images. You can see on the top left, there's the uh, top side of, of the structure, you know, typical, um, you know, type, type of, uh, you know, improvements and conditions there where you have gravel. It's uh, constructed in the, the 30s, 40s and 50s as far as the improvements go. Um, those the blue steel that you see there is some, there's been a, a few improvements, but they're probably 30, 40 years old themselves. And uh, overall, it's all, overall, it's in pretty good condition as far as um, having pedestrian traffic and, and park uh, conditions up there. You can see bottom left is a stairwell. Um, things are pretty well worn, so there would obviously have to be some significant improvements to the, the railings and things like that, but the concrete itself is, is pretty well intact. Uh, bottom right, you can see underneath there's a, um, pillar uh, type structure that holds it up for the most part. There's also um, on the, the east or the western end, there is a section of it that's actually at grade that you can get on. And then there's, uh, I think, three different stairwells spread throughout at different intersections that enable you to get from the street grade up to the, up to the top side. And the top right is another view um, of the, uh, the top of the structure. And the next slide shows the award-winning design which essentially is, uh, you know, I think it took some inspiration from the High Line and from other projects internationally. It's got, uh, you know, as you could see, you know, tremendous, tremendous amount of greenery, you know, very park-like, but also it's designed for active uh, recreation as well. So you see uh, people biking and running. Um, there's benches kind of off in a distance to the left. And then, um, you know, at the bottom left, you can see the raised platform. There's, um, you can really see that kind of the, the living wall um, on, on the side of it and probably on both sides, especially in areas where you have um, the, the, the corridor going through residential neighborhoods. As you'd imagine, 20 feet up, you're basically at a second story window. So you wanna provide some privacy uh, for both the residents and also the, uh, the people that are recreating up there. And then bottom right, you see a cross section which shows a pretty clear view of the pillars underneath. One of the things I'm going to circle back to in a, in a minute is they, um, you know, I guess what came out of this as we were actually doing the project, an idea um, came up from SIEDC where, you know, instead of only focusing on the top side activation, there's an opportunity on the underside as, as well, as far as, um, you know, you have these, these corridors that are right next to the sidewalk. Some of them go straight through, uh, you know, from one street to the other, right across a block. So you have an opportunity to really activate those spaces as well. And the next slide shows the um, existing conditions as far as the street level view goes. I think this is at Port Richmond Avenue, which is um, a pilot study area that was chosen uh, during the project. 
to focus on. And, and basically what the pilot study is, and I'm, I'm gonna go to another slide in a second, is you know, the, where we have a, a very large ambitious project. Um, you sometimes, or I would recommend all the time in those types of projects, you wanna have um, easily implementable initial steps. That's kind of the low hanging fruit to that. You know, you've got the momentum of the project while you're doing the feasibility study. And then if you have recommendations that are realistic and able to be implemented right after you, you conclude it, you can keep the momentum of the project. And then by, you know, developing those, you know, completing those initial steps, you're able to actually lay the groundwork for the bigger steps. And before you know it, you've, you've gained a lot of ground in um, completing a, a massive project. So these are representative images, um, like precedent images, I guess you could say, provided by MKW. And these are some of the inspiration that we're using to come up with a way to activate the underside. Um, and you can see, you know, a lot of vibrant color. Um, you know, there's different types of uses. You can see public art in the bottom left photo, um, you know, murals in the top right, different types of lighting themes. And, uh, you know, these are some of the, the elements that we're gonna try to bring in to recommend. And, um, you know, the street is, I guess from an implementation standpoint, it's it's sidewalks already there, the streets already there. It's easily implementable. You wouldn't necessarily have to improve a staircase or, or put in an elevator in order to get to the top so where, where you would have to for the top side. The um, street level is actually pretty much ready to go. And then um, just to actually wrap up on on that before I get I get to this next slide. So that was um, a real quick run through of some of the the main elements of the Skyway feasibility study. And, um, you know, a couple points I wanted to draw out, you know, based upon that are, you know, you have um, the strategy to provide realistic, easily implementable steps at the outset of a project so that you can actually continue to gain momentum. As you're doing that, you apply for grants and different types of, of funding and, and uh, approvals to take the next steps in the project. And before you know it, you're, you're well on your way to completing the project. And then also a uh, project like that is a great opportunity to include recommendations for revitalizing the community. So in the report, we're including recommendations for adjacent sites that are underutilized. Let's say, you know, they're in a downtown, but they have a construction yard. It's probably not the best use, you know, for a downtown area it might be better suited to, let's say commercial residential or, or something else that would, would um, bring more people into the, into the community and also uh, help economically in terms of business. So um, we're trying to use that, that feasibility study to actually, you know, provide wholesale um, positive um, change and opportunity in, in the community. And then as Adam had mentioned um, at the start, we're also involved in a stormwater feasibility study. And this is a, a photo of the um, existing conditions at one of the intersections that we studied. Um, this is in the uh, West Shore Business Improvement District, just south of the Amazon um, uh, warehouses that went in. And, um, you know, essentially with Amazon coming in and, and the other warehousing operations, the existing traffic, you have not only do you have dump trucks and other large vehicles, you know, work that you have today, but you've added uh, passenger vehicles because Amazon actually staffs up quite a bit and they have their operation runs and shifts. So there's a need to actually have passenger vehicles accommodated on these roads. And as you can see, this dump truck uh, is having no problem getting, getting through this giant puddle. This is actually a good day um, on the street at the time. Uh, so it gets much worse than this, you know, add, add a foot, a foot and a half to that on, on a bad day. A Toyota Corolla or something equivalent would have a really tough time getting through there. So this is one of the projects that we, we prioritize. And what we did kind of along the same lines as what I had mentioned for the Skyway is on the upper left, we proposed improvements in phases. So you have uh, phase one on the upper left is a relatively simple project just to elevate the worst part, the low spot of that, that roadway. And, uh, you know, improve public safety, get the vehicles out of the water, improve drainage. Um, and that'll, you know, get you through that intersection on most days of the year, you still might have trouble on a couple of days, but, you know, it's a good initial step. And then on the upper right is wholesale uh, improvement of that entire stretch, probably like a quarter mile. That would be elevating that entire stretch of road and providing a culvert, which you see kind of center left um, underneath the street that obviously would be a whole different level of expense and permitting. So that would be phase two to, to come after. But um, what SIEDC and uh, West Shore Bid did is they went after grants and funding and uh, they got uh, $130,000 to do that phase one improvement. And this is actually the current condition of the street after the project was implemented. And you can see it's it's been raised, I wanna say probably at least you know 12 to 16 inches, maybe a little bit more. And you can see new curbing on each side of the street um, where there's actually some piping 
to allow some of the water, at least on a, on a, a later um, flow day, to make it under the street rather than going over the street. And uh, I guess the, you know, one of the key points here is that this is an example of taking a study that, you know, it, well, it starts as a, a concept in someone's mind, study gets funded, it gets written, and then ideally, you know, with a good um, strategy, community involvement, and, uh, you know, putting the pieces together and continuing to carry it forward, you can actually see real world changes um, on, on the ground in the community. So um, just a, uh, I think a, a good example of that. And um, I think that's, that's all I have. And great, Peter, thank you. Um, uh, you know, that uh, I think that was a great real world example. And, you know, as a, a, and at least I think what we'll do is we'll continue to march through because there's such great synergy between what Peter just said and what, what Eugene um, and, and Kay are going to talk about in, in wrapping up here as we, we leave some time for Q&A as well. But you can see it right on the ground where the walkway, where the greenway, where the, the rail line, where whatever it is is gonna to touch the ground has direct effects on people's community. And that planning that you can see in there, that vision that's going on is so critical for folks to get involved because it is the difference in driving by something saying, wow, I really can't believe that's there versus wow, I can't believe that's there, right? Um, and uh, it, it, a lot of folks tend to be critical when they don't get involved. Um, and, and speaking of that, Eugene, I know, um, he, he, uh, you've gotten some exciting projects as well, and some that I think are, um, speaking of thinking out of the box, some visionary stuff that folks, you know, in a world where you live on an island, have to sometimes think about. And I'd lo love to hear your thoughts about some of the planning work you've done and kind of what you've seen as successful and not on the island. Sure. Thanks, Adam. So I think uh, my name is Eugene Flotteran. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, I, I'm a partner at a firm here, Cetrarty Architecture here in New York. We're architects, interior designers, and uh, urban planners. Um, I'm also a lifelong Staten Island resident. So I grew up on Staten Island and it's very close to my heart. So, you know, a big part of our practice is uh, doing these mixed use, multifamily types of projects. And we've been doing them all over the you know, city of New York. Uh, Staten Island has been one of the last boroughs really to kind of come into the fold because, you know, Staten Island's density of where we live is much more uh, suburban and low residential scale. And, you know, we took a very independent look, you know, this whole organization, SIDC, which I joined, I think right after we did our kind of vision for Staten Island, which I'll show you shortly, all came from two big things, you know, and one of them was thinking big and the other one was getting involved. Um, and you'll see like Rachel's project um, and Kay's project and Peter's project all come out of uh, things that the SIDC as a non-for-profit organization kind of spearheaded to make things happen. And it was very interesting because, you know, our plan that we put out in the world actually got us involved with the organization. And I started becoming very actively involved. And I've been lucky to be kind of on a few of the steering committees and these different uh, studies that were done through the SIDC. So, you know, our whole project and our whole idea just came from like a, like a passion project for me personally and my firm um, you know, wanted to get involved again, pro bono at really kind of, and we had no real rules that we had to follow, but it came out of one simple question that came out of uh, 2017 when the census came out and the population was, you know, looking to be gro growing from eight to 9 million where we're New York is going to be living in the future. And all the work we were doing in the other boroughs seemed to have not really landed in Staten Island yet. And, you know, we were there in Brooklyn 15 years ago where, you know, from Dumbo to the next train stop to the next train stop, development occurred along the train line. And I started to see being an architect and planner at Staten Island started to, you know, a few years back, started the project started to show up on Staten Island that looked like what was, what was starting to happen in the other boroughs. So development was growing, you know, rapidly in Manhattan. It was then growing rapidly in Brooklyn. It was moving to Queens. It's now moving through the Bronx and Staten Island seemed to be the last one to the, uh, to the party here a little bit, basically because of our little bit of the geographic isolation from the other parts of the city. But I saw the projects happening in St. George. I saw the wheel site, which was coming out in the world, the, the lighthouse point uh, site. And Rachel had a lot of these sites on her little early image, but the Irby, the, Outlet, uh, the Empire outlets all started to happen and development started to land in Staten Island and it started to, you know, already started to grow down the, the one rail line that we have. And, you know, city planning started to rezone the very first stop in and did the Bay Street rezoning. 
With all that happening, it kind of spurred us when the question was asked, where would people live, these other million residents? We said, why not Staten Island? You know, if properly planned for, we took a very like forward thinking 50 year, maybe look ahead, maybe beyond 2040. And with some of the assumptions that if the population were to double in some period of time, 50 or 100 years, what would we plan today to handle that growth? And that was kind of the, the genesis of what we, what we were put together. So we spent a few weeks doing a ton of research, all these kinds of studies that are out there right now that sometimes seem like they you know, lost a little bit on deaf ears with things that are out there that we look to and kind of informed what we came up with. I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, one. Okay. Is that up? I can't see. You guys see that? Okay. So, so this was what we called a vision for Staten Island. Again, completely independent study about how do we get in front of development and it was really a call for a master plan and a call for a holistic approach about future developments that, you know, why not be a borough that got proactive about what was going to happen to us? I saw it land, I saw it start to grow, and I just figured it's going to come. And as an architect and planner, you know, it would be great to actually jump in front of something like this and start thinking about, you know, a holistic kind of development strategy uh, with a bigger and maybe longer term thinking. So we came up with this thing, a vision, just that now, not the vision, but a vision. The hope of it was actually to be a living kind of document of ideas and could evolve over time. And it, it focused on like four big points that we saw as a way to start to tie the developments that were starting to happen around the island. And you could see on Rachel's earliest slide is all kinds of projects all over the island happening already. But how to like stitch all that together in a holistic way. And the four big opportunities that we saw were really this kind of, you know, this is this eastern side rail line where I believe development will just follow the next station, you know, train station over and it'll work its way around, you know, from, uh, from north to south. So how to capture that into like the overall borough with just the opportunity to start to create a node of activation on this eastern side that could be a little bit more resort oriented, built around some of the uh, projects that are starting to happen. You can see some of the, in, in Rachel's slide, some of these waterfront plans that are happening on this edge here and kind of creating an anchor point for, you know, ideas of where development could land that start to tie into the development that will follow this eastern side and how to bring that across the island, you know, east to west. And one of the, you know, projects sort of in the middle here was Fresh Kills Park, which is, you know, starting to open now. This is this, this huge park that's going to be, you know, three times the size of Central Park. It's starting to open its first phases and, and something that's, you know, starting to happen. And just some of the retail corridor that gets you from this western side through to that portion of the island where we can, you know, kind of expand upon the retail corridor, create a little bit more of a cultural center. And then, you know, going further west here, there's a little bit of opportunities where we see a lot of the, you know, the colleges and universities and a little bit of an office campus happening. So the idea of a tech center and ultimately we saw the most opportunity on the western side of Staten Island, which, you know, this plan was before Amazon's first warehouse actually landed here. And Amazon has landed in this zone here. And one of our projects that Rachel kind of showed in her slide was, you know, this corporate park that's going on over here by the teleport. So, you know, we were calling for this master plan proactive, you know, we're coming up with a very, you know, strategically planned sustainable growth strategy built around mixed use types of develop developments that all tied into a multimodal transportation system. So we put this out in the world and when, then we brought on a transportation consultant who actually put, you know, some of the transportation solutions to this bigger idea of how this would be a comment. Because really the, the thing that's the biggest impetus in Staten Island is, is transportation. It's all car dependent. There's only one train line and then one ferry stop off the island. And really we are four bridges to all the other boroughs, three to Jersey and one through Brooklyn. So, you know, transportation is our biggest hindrance. And he kind of overlaid on our plan, a transportation solution that could be phased and incrementally brought on that could support these kinds of developments. So these were just the bigger ideas. It was back in 2017. And what I'm proud to say, I think some of the other studies that the SABC has kind of um, got 
involved with kind of activating and, and bringing on these other groups that are on this call, this plan started to be referenced as ideas that could be tied into other visions that were being brought to us. So it was a really big thinking, getting involved and doing something very proactive instead of reactive to what we saw as something that was going to start to happen. Um, and then, you know, just the, the bigger kind of strategy and overall concept was just looking at the existing condition, which is, you know, developments happening, but they're very disconnected. They're very much vehicle dependent. Um, and they're really kind of focusing more on the, you know, eastern side along the rail line. And we looked at a more optimized the creation of network um, and nodes becoming much more connected east to west that would start to kind of open up the western side of Staten Island for maybe the greatest opportunities uh, of, of development. The, the largest amounts of kind of unused land were on that western portion. And so this was kind of like the overall uh, strategy of connection. Um, and then, you know, one of the big projects that came out of this, because, you know, we did this, we put it on the world, and, you know, what is it worth? Uh, it started a lot of conversations. It, it brought us into over, I mean, it was over 40 resources of information that tied into the ideas. We put together an 80 page white paper of our fun, findings and studies. We published that out in the world. We were then invited to many panels to discuss big visions, big thinking ideas. We brought Staten Island into the conversation, which was part of, you know, the idea of, you know, the effort. Um, it started to really kind of develop a 20 publications, speaking engagements where this thing has been now discussed. And we are very proud that we were able to kind of bring, you know, what's going on in Staten Island to a forefront to maybe, you know, influence what will happen next. Um, and like I said, some of the other studies that you'll see today all kind of start to reference this particular plan and just some of the ideas. And one of the transportation ideas that came out of this, you know, really kind of stuck with us because we kept thinking, now, what else can we do with this besides for talking about it and talking about the need to be proactive and plan for our future? What else can come out of it? And, you know, the Western side opportunity that showed up in this plan, you know, tied to a transportation solution that our consultant brought to the table. And it happened to tie in very nicely some, with some programs SIDC was uh, pushing forward you know, the Skyway project that Pete is involved with, which is an activation of a, you know, a piece of rail line, an abandoned rail right away on the west side of Staten Island to activate as public space. But the MTA had other plans for it. They're preparing for a BRT uh, bus rapid transit connection that might utilize that right of way. And our consultant looked at this phase transportation that could work with and be a part of. And one of his solutions was the aerial um, transportation solutions that are gondola type uh, transportation solutions that are starting to happen around the, around the world. You see them in London, you see them around the world, they're in Portland as maybe a transportation future that could be part of Staten Island's growth as a first almost phase to you know, what could happen in, in this multimodal transportation solution and build upon some of the current studies. So we recently over the last year started to focus in on this transportation because one of those solutions that came out of this study was this aerial gondola that could actually tie Staten Island ultimately to Brooklyn and ultimately to Manhattan as you know, the first piece of public transportation that was not a car that would actually tie our borough to the rest of the other five boroughs, at least three of the other, uh, two of the other uh, five boroughs with Staten Island. Um, and we started to look at this as really the key development or transportation project that could really lead to a lot of the opportunities are starting to happen already. Um, and we have now recently over the last year have been focusing on the idea of a point to point first phase of this transportation and been talking to local officials about the idea of it that can maybe work in concert to what they're already planning with the BRT system here that would support the SIDC uh, Skyway project, also support SIDC's Gondola project along the Bayonne Bridge, and you know, and in, in you know the original R train when it was you know from our research we found out the R train which lands at this point in Brooklyn was originally supposed to extend into Staten Island that never happened which would really connected our borough to the other parts of the city but the gondola you know future gondola path of maybe going parallel with the bridge and avoiding going under the water could be a part of connecting it so we've been actually putting this out in the world now. And some of the imagery that comes off of this, and this kind of is almost this idea of, you know, what should come first, the development or the transportation that supports the development? We're actually looking at 
going backwards maybe to what we used to do where transportation came first and are really pushing this project now recently as maybe the transportation project that ties into whatever the other projects that are in the going on in the borough now to release some of the congestion that ultimately could tie Staten Island to Brooklyn and Manhattan directly which there's nothing out there being planned that could do that and again this all came out of you know some of the research in our project and so we've been you know looking at point to point connections and how they can kind of expand upon the two opportunity zones are in Staten Island one here on this west side and one that's already going on the east side um, and just what that could do to, in terms of potential of moving people and really creating something that have a, a bigger vision of connecting the borough over a longer duration of a plan and then just some imagery of what that can feel like on the water's edge. I mean, it's much more about activating our water's edge, dealing with the resiliency issues that the borough is going to have to deal with, creating smart, economic, you know, sustainable 20th century solutions, 21st century solutions for for Staten Island. So this is, you know, some of the imagery that came out of some of our, you know, recent work. And again, we took a very different approach. We were not hired to do this. We did it proactively because of our experience and, our, and my particular passion for where I live and being a part of maybe what happens next. And again, just getting involved. And so this led us getting involved with the EDC, uh, SIEDC. Um, we've had the New York City EDC contact us and we've presented these things to them. We've had the Regional Planning Association contact us. We've been presenting. We're getting the word out. Very much grassroots, very much about, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here, a lot of things that we talked about. How do we be proactive? How do we get it going? We've talked to the universities on Staten Island who are very excited for different reasons of what this could mean for the borough in terms of attracting, you know, more students, what this could mean for the borough, attracting more jobs and higher paying jobs, and what this could mean to tie into what's already happening and start stitching the projects together in a more holistic approach. So that's something that we got involved with that I think is started to inform a lot of things that I've gotten involved with personally as, a, as an individual with my particular background. And again, it's all about thinking big, thinking out of the box, and I think being proactive um, and getting involved. And that's, if, anything, if any of the younger students are watching and if there's any key takeaway, get involved. Because getting involved, you get to have some influence on where you live and how it develops. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Eugene. That's uh, and uh, I love the vision. Uh, as you know, I'm I'm a big believer. And uh, to what you said, right? This is um, this is all about people taking that step forward uh, and getting in the middle of the mix and understanding some of the elements of what it takes. Which is why I'm glad, Kay, uh, you're closing the day. And we've got some extra time, so no worries for everybody. We'll have time for questions as well. Um, because you know, in this this look at economics and real estate and planning and how it all comes together to make a financeable project. Um, I think that's a big difference um, between those visions that, that sit and those that implement. And that's why I think that big picture is so critical because it's got to come together. And so, so Kay, with that, uh, you know, I'll ask you to close us out here and talk about your background and a lot of the projects you've worked on and specifically that nexus of, of economic and you know, planning and what becomes reality. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, so, hello, my name is Kay Hayashi. I'm the principal of a small economic and planning firm called BJH Advisors. Uh, we've done work in um, the New York City metropolitan region as well as the Northeast um, and the Mid Central Atlantic uh, area. Uh, we've done a few of the um, planning projects that were referenced. And um, the one I'm going to talk about today is the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, the SEDS. We sort of picked up where Hatch left off. Um, in 2019, um, the Staten Island um, Economic Development Corporation was awarded a SEDS grant from the federal government. And um, in bringing this uh, kind of wrapping everything up, the planning process really starts with identifying um, a problem that needs to be solved um, and then translating the problem into a series of goals. Um, here is the, this is the vision, the SEDS vision, which was to really um, solidify relationships between the educational and cultural institutions on the island, to do some rezoning in a downtown 
areas, invest in public transit, encourage denser transit oriented neighborhoods and increase sustainable design and resiliency. Um, we developed a series of goals and then um, through leadership and really focusing on the economics, the feasibility and the financing, we were able to hone in on a set of priority projects. Um, and I wanna stress that leadership and economics are really important and the list of uh, players including Eugene, the SEDS uh, committee members were really instrumental in kind of guiding the process. And so without leadership and financial feasibility, um, the projects that make it through the planning process um, are unlikely to be implemented. Um, I have a very long presentation, which I'm not gonna go through, but I just wanted to point out the color coding on these four goals carried through and we were then able to identify, this is the purple, the neighborhood cluster of goals and then specific kind of priorities and potential partners. And all along we were really thinking about partnership, this column in the middle, because the partnership was our proxy for who was gonna be the leader or the sponsor in picking you know, priority projects in certain areas. This set of goals and the, the partners was for the workforce and industry development um, potential partners for transportation and mobility, including the borough president and Staten Island University Hospital, um, the Regional Plan Association. And then the last goal was resiliency and infrastructure. And here are the potential partners were EDC, New York City Parks Department, um, again, Staten Island Economic Development Corporation, National Grid, um, Department of Environmental Protection. We, honed in through talking to leadership, doing outreach to an extensive list of priority projects. It goes on for a couple of pages. So these are the projects that kind of made it through our planning process and were identified as potentially implementable. And so if you're kind of wondering like, how does the planning process kind of then select projects um, that was uh, you know, done through a series of the desktop analysis and stakeholder outreach and, and early financial feasibility that everyone has talked about. And then a key area of our report was looking at the funding opportunities. And so again, for each of the, the areas, the goal areas, the one on the left is neighborhood clusters, the one on the right is workforce and industry development. We identified potential funding streams, federal, state, and local. Um, and this is just a high level list, but behind each one of these programs, we had kind of a path towards kind of what amount of funding could be available and what kind of applications and, and you know, partnership, sponsorship, lobbying um, applications were needed in order to secure the funding. And these, this, these two lists were for the last two, the transportation and mobility goal, and then the resiliency and infrastructure. So when planning is going on, it's it, the vision guides everything, but it's always good to kind of have your eye on the end goal, which is how do you implement something? How do you pay for something? And, um, you know, without kind of having a leadership strategy and a funding strategy, it's unlikely that your plan will ever get implemented. So, you know, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. And I think um, with that, I'll just turn it back over to Adam and I can answer any questions that anyone might have about specific projects that we identified. Great, Kate, thank you. Um, and, I, and I hope what everybody saw, because uh, that was, and I know that was a lot to, to take in, but that, you know, you can see this funnel, right? As it starts from this picture and, and the belief in what areas are underutilized, need change. And as you go down, you begin to examine the the fabric of what that change is. And then you begin to develop that picture that you saw that Eugene put up there, that physical layout. And then to that end, right, how does it get physically done? Well, each of those little segments of a picture, as Kay described, have to be matched up in sort of a, you know, great matchmaking game with funds and resources and stacked in order so that the plans turn to reality. And, you know, we're living today, and I want to thank the panelists because this was fantastic. You know, I hope the folks watching and realize you're living today in a moment where in 10 years, a lot of this will be reality. Um, and if you don't participate now, you can't complain about it later, um, or you can, but it'll be too late. Um, and so uh, and so we'd encourage you to please look up, uh, you know, where you live, as I said, where your school is, where your house is, where your family is, um, and take a look at what plans overlay, what's been done, some of the great work that you just heard 
you know, Peter and Rachel and Eugene and Kay talk about here, um, it's out there, it's available, it's online at SIEDC and other places. So, so take a look and ask, feel free to ask questions. And so, so with that, Anissa, I'll just stop and see if there are any questions from here. I know we're running short on time. So we have a question from Ray. Uh, he'd like to know if the presentation is gonna be shared with attendees. Um, and he'd also like to know, this is for Eugene, how can someone get involved? Well, you know, I think the raised question was how to someone get involved with the SIDC. Um, it, it's, you know, I don't know if you have, I mean, I got involved just by kind of reaching out to the organization and asking and, and offering my services and what we've done. And I was quickly asked to join and, you know, my firm joined the membership. But as an individual, I think you just have to reach out to the organization and, 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 and call them and ask how to, what they're doing next, follow their programs and come to the events and, and join in. Um, it's like any other kind of organization that there are definitely, you know, this is a non-for-profit. There's a lot of people who volunteer for all the different events. They're always looking for people who want to get involved. Um, and then it's about attending these kinds of events and, and having something to say is really what's important, you know, because you can join any organization, but if you don't really participate, you don't get that much out of it. So like everything else, it's a, as much as you put into it, you get out of it. So, you know, I didn't just join to come to the lectures. I joined and got a little further involved about how do I get involved with your programs? Uh, and I've been fortunate and, you know, to be invited to a, a lot of things like this where we get a chance to talk about what we're thinking about and doing and hopefully, again, getting the word out. Um, you know, I, I think it's what's important, like Rachel's, you know, local needs led into this sense that Kay's group had actually further developed and starts to put a, a master plan-ish implementable strategy together and all these kind of uh, official documents, and these are really official documents. These are the kind of documents the city agencies look to uh, to kind of make their decisions about what projects come next. I mean, everything that happened with the wheel site, which I know is on pause and may never happen, but it will be something someday. Um, the Empire site, outlet site on Staten Island, the Light Point, House Point, and the Irby site, all these are RFPs the city put out there for sites they had kind of control over. And a lot of these studies all inform, you know, what kinds of projects the community needs. Uh, and it's really the collective kind of delivering of those projects that really kind of make something happen um, and really kind of make, you know, something new happen that wasn't really kind of there before. I mean, right now those are all tough examples because they've all been waiting for each other to kind of happen and they haven't happened all together yet. So they've all been the first to the table, but I really feel like so much has happened and landed there. And I think there's measured success and, and difficulties, but I think it's gonna keep coming. So, you know, get involved and be in front of it and ask for what you want is I think the most important thing that everyone can do. Uh, thank you, Eugene. I just, sorry, Adam, didn't mean to cut you off. Just to add to that, uh, Ray, just wanted to let you know that you can always reach out to the SIEDC, SIEDC.org. We have tons of resources there and you can obviously just reach out to us. However, phone, email, we're, we're available all the time. Okay, uh, any other questions? Um, now we just have a thank you from Ray. I think uh, I don't see anyone else that raised their hand. Okay, so with that, uh, um, uh, let me just say a thanks again to the panelists. I think that was great. And, uh, you know, hope we get a, we'll, we'll get some follow-up questions that come out of this as it gets rebroadcast. And then to uh, a, a special thanks to you and Issa and to the SIABC and to Caesar and Jody and the whole team for putting this all together as always. And uh, yeah, thank you guys. We look forward to uh, working on many projects as we see them through to implementation on that. Very, very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and for being a part of this. We really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great time.